today, September 1st. September 1st is an amazing day. It is my birthday ease. <laughs> just know that I'm going to be celebrating all month. All month, just in case you're wondering, this is my birthday month. You guys are going to hear a lot of yelling and screaming and celebrating every Sunday morning. I am going to be in the house, loud and proud, September birthday. So be ready to roll, because George is going to be in there with me. Whoop, whoop. Yeah, good stuff, good stuff. Um, yes, their anniversary and the Martin's anniversary is in September as well. And Melanie is getting yep. married on Saturday, so she's not here today. But praise the Lord for her. Yes. So exciting for her and for Courtney. And um, we're going to have a blast. Amen. All right. So we're going to go ahead and get opened up in prayer on this evening. We got another jam packed evening where we are going to hit these scriptures hard and really begin to open up our understanding of the things that have been keeping us from being fully grafted in and from achieving the goal of walking out our purpose, our giftings, our callings, amen? We learn that our giftings come as an accompaniment to our purpose, right? To our office or our calling, what we're called to do. So they are there to accompany us, amen? So we're gonna go ahead, amen. get opened up in prayer, and then we are gonna go right on into um, talking about how do we know that Jesus is our brother and that God is our father? How do people know that? How are we displaying it to the world? But then after that, we're going right into the word. Amen. All right. Who would like to open us up in prayer? Wow, Danita, you are so amazing. Thank you for volunteering. You're awesome. You got this. Come on, let's go. You got it. Lord, we thank you for letting us all gather today here in person and, and online thank and you, we thank you for just opening our minds and taking in everything that you want us to learn tonight and um, anybody that's on their way we thank you to have them have a safe journey here and we just thank you for being a part of this tonight and letting us take in everything that you want us to learn amen amen good job amen Yay! Look at you guys go. I'm so proud of you. All right. She's going to kill me later, but it's all good. Amen. We got this. No, I felt it coming. <laughs> she tried to look straight ahead like I didn't notice that. She's like, if I look like this, she'll never know that I'm not going to do this, right? Amen. All right. So our scripture for tonight, of course, is 1 Peter 3.15. In the New King James, it says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And in the Amplified, it says, always be ready to give a logical defense to anyone who asks you to account for the hope and confident assurance elicited by faith that is within you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. So I'd like to know, how are you displaying to the world that God is your father and Jesus is your brother? What things have happened in the week since we were last together? I just really say, like, go to God. Like, he will help you. I mean, that's all I have. I don't really know how other way to say it. So I just say, like, he will help you. You need him. Take this. It's my little sister. I got to make sure it's not my dad. Yeah. So I hit the wrong button. That's okay. It is a okay. So um, for me, for this week, first of all, there's always that starting point when it comes to when you begin to share that portion with God and you continue to kind of build up little by little. So all of us have to start somewhere. We, we do not forsake small beginnings. We don't despise it. And so even just saying that has an insurmountable ability to 
even give someone the direction which way they should go because there's so many people who are trying to tell people to go somewhere else to other gods or other in other areas or deities um and so even saying that it's an awesome thing so don't don't down yourself that you may not be as extravagant in words than others it's, Man, look, there's so many cases in the Bible when people are like, look, I got a stuttering problem. I got issues. I am challenged. And for some, that becomes the very thing that God uses to keep them humble, to show there is a need for him. So, girl, you good. You are good. <laughs> Amen. Go to God. The only thing that I would say to add to it is say, go to Jesus. That way you can be specific about the God that you're sending them to. Um, oftentimes people are praying to other gods and we don't know them. I see things on Facebook that say, bring your light into that darkness. Ooh, that's so good. I try, I tried to do it earlier today, but the person was not having it. Oh, so we'll teach you as you continue on with this journey with us, we'll teach you how to bind that stuff up. And so remember, we talked last week about how when um, you're faced with those things, what strategy are you putting in place so that they can't get to you again? And so this is why I say, go back and rewatch the Bible studies. I rewatch the Bible studies every week. I do that on purpose. I refresh myself on what we talked about because I can't remember it all. Some stuff is off the cuff, you know, because I'm getting fresh download. So I have to go back and say, okay, what did you say to me <laughs> last Thursday, Lord? Let's, let's listen to this and see what's going on. Go back and listen to it again because it'll help give you the instructions. Usually you get a test somewhere in the week after you learn something. It happens every time. You get a test during the week. It's going to pop up. And how are you going to respond or react in the middle of it? So we usually react when we're not prepared. So something happened today um, where I reacted instead of responding. Usually I would have handled things a lot differently, but this time I went full-fledged flesh. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And so then Kamiko was like, okay, calm down. <laughs> first, the first thing you're going to do is calm down. And then the second thing you're going to do is you're going to go back to your house. <laughs> That's what you're going to do. And you're going to sit on your couch and you're going to study and prepare for Bible study. Because I was running around like a chicken with my head cut off. Usually that would not be me. The amazing thing about it is that I keep people around me who can help me to remain in alignment with Christ. Because sometimes you get caught off your game. I'm tired right now, you know. We're burning both ends of the candlestick. Me and Debbie got home at what, 9, 9.30 last night? You know, after a very long day with our father and mother, and I mean, just the emotions of everything that's going on and I'm sleeping, but not sleeping, you know how that goes. So you find yourself in that position where you're off your game a little bit. And so put that plan in place so that that enemy that's using the person to come against you can't keep getting you the same way. Amen. Amen. It's not that they're rejecting you. Yeah. They're rejecting God or they're rejecting Jesus. So don't take it personally. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what the Bible says. They are not rejecting you. They are rejecting him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, uh, dude that I work, at, work with, uh, it was funny because I listened to some Christian music and I told him when I did that, and he said, He's like, I used to believe in God, but my grandma died. And then now I want to be a really hey, hey, yes. atheist. And I was like, I don't believe that. I was like, I looked down and I said, I don't believe that. And I was sitting there in my mind, I was like, I got you. <laughs> I'm going to get you. Yeah. <laughs> and that's exactly what it is. He's going to see through your change. It's going to, just like Charlie, you guys got a chance to see Charlie and Barb start to shift around and change. And then it got you guys going, hmm, what's going on over there at 530 Northeast Broadway? <laughs> Next minute, you know, you're showing up and then you're bringing your daughter with you and you got the niece coming with you, et cetera, right? And so that's how that goes. When they see your change, then it's like, 
okay, what's going on over there that's different than what I experienced over here? So just let your light shine. And as difficult as it may be, because it gets hard sometimes, keep pressing in and keep pressing on the victory. That has been my saying for the last few weeks. I am pressing on to victory, literally. Some days are good. Some days I might trip and fall face first, face plant. Other days I'm, you know, conquering it all. But each day is different. And as I go through each day, I am learning something new each day. And the Lord is continuing to help to develop me more and more into who I am. And he's going to do the same with you. Amen. All right. Anyone else want to share their testimony of how you're displaying to the world that God is your father and Jesus Christ is your brother. Take it. Go for it. <laughs> All right, here we go. So, um, we don't see you. I uh, now you do. So, uh, <laughs> has press button. So, on this um, past week, I was sitting in my office, and the in the office is a bunch of stuff. But we have a phone in our office. Since I'm so new, like my voicemail isn't set up, none of that nature. But we have to have a phone in our office in case anyone wants to get a hold of us. But the good part or the bad part, I'm counting the good part right now, is no one knows what my extension is. So my phone shouldn't go off. But for some reason, my phone went off one of the mornings. The days are starting to run together. I just know I'm there in the morning. So the phone rings. I answer it. And it is, um, it is one of my former students from years ago who is now working within the school district, mm. which is fine. So I'm like, cool, awesome. Saw you at orientation. Cool. And I couldn't tell if, in what she mentioned was, hey, I just wanted to tell you some things. In my brain, I'm like, okay, I don't think I said anything out of pocket to you. I don't think I did anything bad. I'm like, so I don't, I think everything's okay. But you know how someone can say things like, I got something to talk to you about. And you're like, okay, is this a serious conversation? Like, you about to press charges? Like, what are we doing here? Like, what? So you start going through all the lists of like, man, what did I did? Like, I didn't do anything. Whatever. So she mentions two things. One, she talks about a student I just had that she mentioned for that student who was her cousin, that her cousin really bummed that I'm no longer at Roosevelt. But it's because I was one of the first teachers to tell her that you're messing up. But to say in a way in which I was walking with her through the math work, mm. not her understanding and knowing that I'm showing you what discipleship looks like. That I'm gonna love you, I'm gonna show you what the issue is, but let you know you're not by yourself. That's right. Because I understand one of the weapons the enemy will try to use is isolation, condemnation, other things, but mainly for the teenagers, isolation. The, I gotta do this all by myself, what I'm gonna do, like that message. And so because I held her accountable, she got through, she achieved higher than what she thought was possible, but it wasn't the grade that that student remembered. It was someone cared about them enough mm -hmm. to talk to them, be authentic with them, but to say, I got you at the end and also celebrate, which is awesome. The second thing this former student shared was she had a friend who came to our church the day that I announced that I was moving to Lincoln. Mm -hmm. And this particular friend of hers heard a sermon about domestic violence. And my student was like, you was up there talking about domestic violence. Once again, through my Rolodex, I have never preached about domestic violence. And I'm like, I didn't even preach that day. Like if you do the welcome, you ain't preaching unless people are like out the country. That's a different story. So I'm like, I didn't talk about domestic violence. But the point is, is that whatever, whoever, which was you apostle, talked about, I looked at the sermon June 5th, talked about domestic violence she had just came out of a domestic violence situation. Wow. And she needed to hear those words that were shared. So I say that to say, when we talk about you being in place in different arenas, you don't know where this is all going to. Mm. I would not have thought that that, I never thought that that person would be connected from a classroom who tells you you cannot say Jesus Christ's name will get them into the door where they get healed at the place where they need to be at. Thank you, Lord. But it's because my character, which is Jesus Christ and God's character, 
make the connection there. So it gave me the confidence I needed and the reassurance that I'm doing the work I need to do. I'm doing this thing God's way. And so even though that was years in the making, that is the confirmation I got this week that I am showing people how God is my father and Jesus Christ is my brother. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. And that's, that's huge because I'm just doing what he said to. I'm saying what he's telling me to say and for it to reach her. And we never knew that that was going on. We never knew. And so that's a blessing. So thank you, Jesus, for that. Thank you, Father, for... <laughs> for reaching her. And I pray that whatever was said, that it actually blessed her. Amen. All right. Anyone else before we move forward? All right. You got your pen, you got your paper, cause you're going to need it. All right. So we're going to go on and continue with our series on soul under control, where we're dealing with healing our soul wounds, just to make sure that we are not ignorant to Satan's devices and that we have healed from the traumas that have taken place within our lives. Now, we want to remember the definition of a wound is an injury to living tissue caused by a cut, a blow, or other impact, typically one in which the skin is cut or broken. And if we're not typically healed, we got to remember hurting people do what? Hurt other people. And that this is not the abundant life that Jesus promised us. And we must remember it is an open door. It's access to the enemy in our lives he is a legalist and he's going to walk through that door if you open it every single time. And if he walks through that door, he is going to do what? Put up a stronghold to keep you from completing your assignment. So what we've been doing here is we've started looking at how the enemy attacks us as children so that we can never come into the full understanding of what it means to be grafted in. And so we've learned the definition of what a spiritual stronghold is. Who knows the definition? Give me the definition of a stronghold. I ask y'all this every week on purpose because I need you to know it. It's been a while since I've been in here. But That's like all right. A fortified uh, place. Yes, it is a fortified place. But a spiritual one. Absolutely. So it is any incorrect thought about God or about yourself. And the purpose of it is to keep you in that, go back to the um, worldly definition of it or the, yep, to keep you in that fortified place so that the enemy can be protected against attack because that's what he wants to do. He wants to put those walls up to keep you isolated. OC just talked about how the, this generation, they go into isolation. So if he can keep you separate, when you watch Wild Animal Kingdom or any of the animal shows where they're out there in the uh, safari and they're out there in the, what do you call it? The desert or whatever. It's not the desert, but the jungle. Who does the Sahara Desert, all of that? So if they have a lion on there or a jaguar, who do they get? Who do they attack? The ones that are by themselves, isolated, or they're hurt, or old. The old ones usually have strategy. They made it to be old for a reason, right? So they might be a little slower than the other ones, yeah. So if they slower than the other ones, then. <laughs> That's called strategy, right? That is called strategy. Push the younger one over there right over to him. Be like, all right, good luck with that. You got, hey, you got some agility. You got speed and agility on your side, and I don't. So, yes. So, notice what this um, definition says. A place where a particular cause or belief is strongly defended or upheld. So what God is saying to us is that he wants us to become a stronghold against the enemy versus the enemy keeping us in his stronghold. Does everybody see the mindset shift that has to take place? We got to get it. We got to catch on to that. Some things are better caught than taught, but you got to become the stronghold. So you have to uphold and defend what you believe. That is why every week I ask you, how are you displaying to the world that Jesus is your brother and God is your father? How do you know that you're effective at what you're showing them? Remember, we talked about being fruitful and the importance of it, and we'll get to that in a minute. 
So we want to become a stronghold against the enemy. So regardless of what the enemy says, we got to know, and we must understand the truth of who God says that we are. Say it with me. I am born on purpose, for a purpose, and with purpose. Remember, God wants to do something for us, in us, and what? Through us. Amen. So remember 1 John 4 and 4 says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is where? In me than he that is where? Amen. So we've got to check our behaviors. We started looking at the handout from the Divine Plumb Line. Everybody should have it. If you are online, you can go to Band, and it is there, and you can see the same handouts that they are using. They have definitions as well as the Divine Plumb Line. And so those are the behaviors that you will see active in a person. So um, it determines who and what we are assigned to. So if these things are showing up that are on either of these columns, that lets you know that you are probably a scion to the enemy right now. You are still connected to the enemy in some way. You may not be fully overtaken by him, which would be possession, but he's got possession of an area in your life. Are you with me tonight? So we want to make sure that whatever we are connected to is what we are going to produce the fruit of. So if we are connected to rejection or re connected to rebellion, and I'm just starting with these two because this leads into so many other things. Amen? But if you're uh, connected to either of these spirits, you're going to produce the fruit of those spirits. And we want to be connected to who? The Holy Spirit. And if we're connected to Holy Spirit, we will produce fruit that remains in Jesus' name. Now, last week, our focus was on recognizing the enemy's plot to keep us out of alignment with the Father and keep us from fulfilling our destiny. So you were provided those two handouts, and one of them listed the characteristics of the spirit of rebellion, which is the divine plumb line, and the characteristics or the manifestations Let's call it what it is. These are manifestations of the spirit of rejection and rebellion. And you also got the definitions. So I asked you to look at those attributes to see what is active within you. And what we were supposed to do is study the definitions when we went home. The ones that we covered that came out of Genesis. Y'all giving me that look like uh, homework. <laughs> the dog ate it. All right. So you were supposed to look at the definitions that we covered from Genesis chapter one and we read 26 to 28. Now, part of our purpose is to ensure the posterity of the nation of Jesus Christ. Who can tell me the definition? Who remembers the definition of posterity? What does posterity mean? Not prosperity, posterity. Who remembers what it means? Leaving something behind. Huh? Live, uh, living for a future generation. Yes, absolutely. So your posterity are going to be your future generations of people. And so uh, 1 Peter 2 and 9 says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So the first thing that we have to establish is that we are a holy nation. We are the nation of Jesus Christ. Our rebirth puts us into his bloodline, his lineage. We are a scion unto the root, amen? Is everybody keeping the connection with me? And if you don't get it, I need you to stop me. Don't let me keep going past so that you don't understand because this is what helps to shift the mindset. It's the teaching that destroys the yoke and destroys the uh, strongholds and the old mindset. Amen? So we are the nation of Jesus Christ. If we are the nation of Jesus Christ, are we going to wait and just let it die with us? So once we all pass on and we're in glory, what happens to the other ones who are behind us? If we don't teach them, raise up a child in the way that they should go, and that way when they are older, they shall not depart from it. If we don't teach them now, what ends up happening is we will lose that posterity and then the Lord will have somebody hidden off somewhere again and then he's going to raise them up and they're going to have to start rebuilding all over again, replenishing the earth. Amen? Remember we read that 
He told them be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. Because every time that the nation of Jesus Christ gets taken down, because the enemy wants to annihilate us, but we're supposed to be the stronghold in the earth. Okay? So he wants to get rid of us. We want to make sure that there is a posterity, that we are pushing forward in all things. So as we read through Genesis uh, 1, 26 through 28, who remembers what we learned from those definitions? What were some of the things that we learned? Last week, Bible study, I kept seeing the word dominion. Ooh, we popping up and like yeah, on TV. Yes. Dominion on the TV. Yes. Boom, boom, boom. And on a truck on my way to work. What? <laughs> Not kidding. Dominion on a truck on the he may as well flew a big hot air balloon past you with it. <laughs> in other words, he's telling you that you're supposed to be dominating in an area in your life and you're not. Anytime God starts echoing things to us like that, that means we didn't catch it the first time. Amen. So dominion, what did, what did we learn about dominion? Tell me about it. You kept seeing it, but what did you learn from it? I didn't really get it until this, like, now. I, I well, know. what are you getting now? Tell us. Uh, well, I smoke, so I feel like he tries to tell me that I need to dominate that. All right. So, so you are going to dominate what is trying to cause you to be addicted. Yes. Or keep you addicted. Yes. So you're going to become the strong man and destroy the stronghold, the lie that tells you you have to smoke to keep your nerves in check. You have to smoke or else you're going to go off. You have to smoke or you're going to eat up everything inside. That's what the enemy is telling. How do I know that? Because <laughs> he told me too. The enemy told me the same thing. I'm going to tell you how I quit smoking. It's going to sound crazy. I was in an abusive relationship and I was so tired of being told what I was going to do. I was being bossed around, being controlled, manipulated, and it was horrible. And I was smoking to keep myself from being nervous and being angry and being all kinds of stuff that I didn't need to be. But what ended up happening is I needed to have control over something. I needed to take control over something in my life. Something needed to, to be controlled other than me. Mm -hmm. So what I did was, I was like, I took the cigarette out and I was getting ready to smoke it. And after I smoked, it didn't do anything. I still was thinking about the same things, still was mad about the same things. Still was trying to figure out how I was going to get out of the situation. It changed nothing, but cost me everything. It was costing me money to have the cigarettes that I didn't have because I wasn't working. It's messing with my health. I'm coughing up stuff, turn my teeth colors, whole nine yards, your breath stinks, all of that. So exactly, your clothes, your hair. So I pull out the cigarette and I'm getting ready to smoke and I happen to look at it. And... Anytime I would try to buck up against my ex-husband, we would fight. And so it controlled me. And I happened to look at the cigarette. And it didn't have arms. And it didn't have legs. It didn't have a mouth. It didn't have a brain. Nor did it have a gun. So how was it controlling me? And all of a sudden, I crushed the cigarette and just threw it on the ground. And I was like, I got more power than you. That's how that went. And I stopped smoking. So every time that cigarette tried to tell me what I was going to do, I said, oh, no. And that was God training me all the way back then. I didn't even know who he was. Church, what is church? I didn't grow up in the church. We didn't grow up in a household like that. My mother told us that the Bible was written by man. Don't believe it. That's what she said. So I knew nothing. But he was showing me about a power that I had within that I was yet to even tap into. And it's the, the same today. You all have a power within that you've got to learn how to tap into. And when you tap into it, you're going to surprise yourself with what happens. You're going to surprise yourself with, did you just smell yourself, George? <laughs> I don't know. 
Did I miss it? I don't know. I thought you were sniffing your armpits. He threw me off. Like, well, that's that's not a pretty thing either. Right here. <laughs> it's not a pretty thing there, you know, but hey. I'll fix it right now. Thank you. So dominion means to rule, to have dominion, to dominate, to tread down, to take lordship is the etymology of it, sovereign or supreme authority, to subjugate, specifically to crumble off. Stop letting the enemy crumble you off. You crumble him off. To come to, to make to, have dominion, to prevail against to reign, to bear, to make, to rule, or become a ruler, or to rule over, to overtake. Amen? So part of what I had to do, number one, I couldn't go into the places where I knew they were going to smoke, so far as we're out of the question. I had to give myself that space to become stronger. So you know, I used to be addicted to alcohol. I couldn't go to a bar and not drink. I couldn't be around my family members knowing that they were gonna party and drink. I had to take a step back until I became strong enough. As I became strong enough, then I would go into situations and I would test and if I felt like the temptation was too great, the Bible says God always gives us a way of escape and I would leave. As much as I wanted to stay, I couldn't. I had to leave so that I could get away and not get caught up in what I didn't want to do anymore. Same thing with having sex. You know, having sex out of wedlock is wrong. So I knew I couldn't be sitting with no dude 12 o'clock at night by myself. That's going to turn out bad every time, every single time. So you have to put things in place. It goes back to what we talked about last week. Last week, we talked about how if you don't put a plan in place, you're planning to fail. So you got to put a strategy in place. So first off, if we're going to go out, we're going out to a public place and you go to your house and I go to mine. We probably don't even need to drive together because that's still too much temptation. <laughs> Let's be clear. I'll drive my car, you drive yours. That way we can't find ourselves caught up in the wrong place at the right time. Amen? Yeah. A way of escape. He gives you a way of escape. Don't even get in the, I love you, but no. I'm going to drive myself. And so that's how you have to do it. Put that plan in place. Amen. All right. What else did we learn last week? So dominate. What were some of the other definitions? Come on, y'all. Got them right in front of you. Talk about it. What about image and likeness? What did we learn about that? Image and likeness. Absolutely. We talk about greater is he who lives in me, but do we look like him? My children look like me. When you put my kids next to me, you know they're my kids. You look at my grandkids, you know they're my grandkids. There's no question. I got one, I promise you, she looks like I spit her out. Looks just like me. And they even act like me in some ways. Some ways I wish they didn't. <laughs> You know, but the reality is you look at my kids, you know, they're my kids. If someone looks at your life at home by yourself, what do they see? Not the one in church. What do they see when you're at home by yourself? It's not always pretty. Does it look like Jesus Christ? So if it doesn't look like Jesus Christ, what are we doing to fix that? Those are the things because that's called character. That's our character. Because what we are here should be the same at home. One of the things that a lot of uh, PKs struggle with is that they live in the house with one person, but everybody else gets somebody else in the church. One of the things that I made sure to say from the pulpit multiple times, don't try to make my kid live up to something that you yourself can't. I said it right from the pulpit and I did not care because people would try to force my child to live up to something that they themselves weren't living. 
you're not going to put that pressure on her. Just like she, you get to learn and grow, and I give you grace, you better give my kid grace too. We all are. So how do they have an example if we're not living? Because I'm trying. And that's what you have to describe. So here's how I'm trying to exemplify that. Now, I don't get it right all the time, but this is what I'm doing to exemplify whatever it is that you're talking about. This is how I'm trying to fix it. No, but I mean, I just was like, okay, like, I'm not, like, I tell my son that he needs to come, just come to church and give it to God, but then he sees me in my frustrations because I'm raising his kids, and I feel like I'm telling him to come to church and give it to God, but then I'm frustrated with raising his kids. Mm -hmm. So I feel like now, maybe I'm taking you wrong, but I feel like maybe I'm kind of like being a hypocrite. I wouldn't call that a hypocrite. Are you practicing living in sin? Not practicing it, no. Exactly. So everybody hits a place of frustration. Um, on vacation, me and my sisters were on vacation. We took our parents who were 79 and 80 at the time. And getting them there was more than an ocean. Setting up dialysis, figuring out how to drive in Mexico, and their traffic, I don't know if you've ever seen their traffic, but it's crazy. Um, they drive like animals, I'm sorry, they do. It's crazy. The way they drive is just, whoa. And so, um, trying to get them to navigate this big, huge campus, for lack of better words, resort. Um, and my mom's got a walker, a rollator, and my dad's on a go-go scooter. And when we got there, the resort had been open for about three weeks and everybody showed up. Every room was completely packed and they were understaffed by like 40 or 50 percent so what ended up happening is there's issues with the rooms issues getting into our rooms issues with what kind of beds we're in they had two women who were not together like that in a king size bed and it was supposed to be a double bed just all kind of craziness so by day three of all the problems i was like here and we were trying to make a decision on something. And I can't remember what it was, but me and my sister Angie had gotten into it and I, was, I said something and then a cuss word came out. Then I got mad at myself because a cuss word came out. And it was a stupid cuss word. It was like, damn, or something like that. But I, it was just out of frustration. I was so overwhelmed because I had spent the first three days of my vacation dealing with the issues of the 19 people who were on vacation with me because things weren't right. And I was the member. So I was so frustrated, boop, it fell out of my mouth and you can't get it back. Now, one of our members who has never seen me angry before is there. Her eyes are big as saucers, like one eye was like this, <laughs> right? One eye was that big. And I'm like, oh, so now I'm mad because I'm now embarrassed myself. I have, you know, said this word you can't take it back it's out there so i just throw my hands up and i'm crying and i walk out the door so now everybody's trying to figure out where she go <laughs> you know so my nephew and he's back there he's trying to you know calm things down we're on vacation everything's gonna be okay blah 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 and you know it happens that happens to people you don't mean for it to happen you don't mean to be um saying the wrong things but sometimes you can find yourself in a position where the enemy can get the best of you. Before I let it get to that place, what should have happened is I should have talked about what was bothering me before I let it go like this. Because it just built up, 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 up. And then all of a sudden, I'm out of character. Had I have stopped and said, hey, 
can we take a walk real quick? I just want to kind of talk through this because I'm taking it like this. This may not be what you intended. And I just want to make sure that I'm not taking this out of context. Even right now, as we go through situations with our parents, um, we were laughing on the phone. I think it was yesterday. It was either yesterday or today, but we were laughing and crying at the same time because I guess that I had said something snippy through a text message and Angie, uh, she thought that me and Debbie were ganging up against her. I mean, it just went into this whole thing. And, and then she was upset because we're going on vacation in January because she couldn't go. I mean, it just went all the way down the line. And it's like, that wasn't even what was intended, but that's how it came out because, you know, there's so many things happening right now. And we're trying to do our best to meet the needs of our parents, go through the things that we're going through. Their health is changing like overnight sometimes. And it's like we're there from six, seven in the morning until God knows how long. And before you know it, you're kind of snipping at each other. And thank goodness that we get on the phone and we have that time just to kind of cry together, pray together, laugh together, laugh at each other because it helps us to regroup. It really does. It helps us to regroup because when you're going through something like that and you think of the stress that we're enduring, watching the, and I hate to say it, transition, there's no other word to use, but transition of our father, you're seeing the transition of your life when you and your husband should be enjoying time together. You're now having to, have this whole new life with grandchildren. So having that conversation with your son is going to be critical. I mean, because we're not perfect. You know, people looking in may think, oh, you know, you go to God, so you got it all together. Like, <laughs> no. <laughs> and God is a God of grace. He is. You know, and that's where, yep, I messed up here, but this is what I'm doing. To, you know, that's get huge. That and that conversation with my son has happened several yeah. times, and that's my yeah. question. <laughs> Even though it's happened several times, what strategy are you putting in place to say, here's the deal. These are my boundaries. I love you, but these are my boundaries. We're not going to overstep my boundaries. And so this is how this is going to go for me. Now, you can make your decision. You have all rights to choose whatever you want. But understand when you make your choice that I get the right to make mine too. So you're going to have to set up those boundaries and guard those boundaries. And it's not a mean thing. You have to keep control because otherwise you're going to make concession for everybody else and lose yourself. And that's what happens. So, you know, in the end, the conversation needs to happen about your boundaries now. Because basically what's happening is you're raising the children and there's almost a, and I don't want to call it this, but I'm trying to think of a better word, like a jealousy, like you're over there living your best life and I'm raising your kids. That's not a jealousy, that's anger. That's a what? That's an anger for me. Yeah. Because yeah. I do feel like he's living it up while I'm, I mean, my marriage, like you said, is not a marriage right now. I mean, because it's in, you know, it's around the kids' life right now. So yeah. <clears throat> but I want him to see the change in me and his sister, and I I want him to get there. And no matter how much encouraging or uh, we talk about God and stuff, it's not getting where we want it to go. <laughs> <clears throat> so, you know, the, the setting up those healthy boundaries can also eliminate a good portion of that confusion in oh, your life. Yeah. And we know where that continues to go, the confusion, frustration, anger. And at yeah. times it goes from zero to a hundred. Right. Exactly. Just immediately. I mean, it has, it has and still at times does in my life. Go ahead. Uh, she has said that it's hard for her to certain times where she's set in her ways. It's hard to set those boundaries. 
Well, here's the thing. How old are you, Danita? 50. So if you've been a certain way for 50 years and now God is showing you a different way before you, now you have to ride a new bike. So when you rode, rode a bike for the first time. I just told her this last night. Uh-huh. That I, I retrained. I wasn't in your house. I retrained in my brain. Yes. And it's not, because I, I think it's because she's so young that she's expecting the training that I'm retraining myself to just it's done and I can't, I told her I'm not built that way. Like it's going to take me some time. <laughs> so you have to tell yourself I'm not built for the other side. You are built like that, but you have to learn how to operate out of the mind of Christ instead of out of your fleshly mind. Right. So right. that's what's happening. You are built like that because Christ is in you. You just have to learn how to tap into who is in you. When I say tap into you, you got to think like him, literally slowing yourself down enough to ask you, yourself those questions. So it's when we're in the fire, it's harder to see your way out. But when my sisters are talking, it's easier for me to draw back and turn into Apostle Steph. I can see. So this is what I'm seeing. Da, 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 da. This is what's going on. This is what the Lord is saying. This is what's happening, right? But if it's me in the fire, it's harder to see. It. That's where I have to stop, slow myself down and say, okay. So for instance, yesterday, my dad was, there was something going on with him. I don't know what was happening, but my dad is the sweetest person you will ever meet in your life. He's funny, he's cool, he's all these amazing things. And he flipped me off twice. The first time I asked him a question, he flipped me off with one finger. I asked him the same question again, said, stop it. And I asked him the same question, he flipped me off with two. And I said, flip them birdies again and God's gonna make your finger not work no more. <laughs> but the reality is, he wasn't in his right mind. He wasn't, he wasn't being himself. So Tippy didn't threaten him. <laughs> that was Apostle Moody. <laughs> Apostle Moody said God gonna flip them fingers around where they won't work no more. So Tippy didn't threaten him. But I mean, it's like I had to leave. I went and grabbed my um, glucosometer because we wanted to check his blood sugar because it was acting so strange to figure out what is going on with you. Cause you, he would never do that. And it should have made me laugh, but instead it was like, okay, you gonna flip me off one more time, you know? And so we got to remember the enemy wants to catch us off our game. And remember, I told you guys, I'm careful who I even answer the phone for right now. If I know it's somebody that's gonna just be there to press the envelope. We're not having a conversation right now. I can't do it. I can't. I love you, but I'm not doing it because I, right now I, I can't. There's too many things going on and I can't take the risk of harming you because <laughs> that's what it's going to do. It's going to harm you. So I, I have to set these boundaries in place because I'm burning both ends of the candlestick. I'm tired. I got a lot of emotions riding all over the place and trying to keep them under control, girding up the loins of my mind. Remember, we had that scripture last week. So girding up the loins of my mind. You guys get to watch me go through this live and in living color. All eyes on me. And as you watch me go through it, the things that I get right, I'm like, hey, look at this. <laughs> Yay, we won. And the things I'm like, oh, well, I sent that text. It didn't quite come across the way that I wanted it. To. It was a little snippy. You know what I mean? So in that, I want you all to take note of that because it's going to give you the strategy as you go through your own personal things. And the one thing you got to be smart enough to do is you've got to go to people who have been in your position. One person that you need to have her number on speed dial, and maybe not right this very instant because of what's happening with my family, but my sister Angie, she raised her grandchildren. And she went through what you're going through. And she had to set boundaries. And she had to say, this is what will happen. This is what not will, will, will not happen. 
So either you can be on this side of it or you can be on the outside of it. I don't care which way you choose, but these are my boundaries. And she had to do it. And you got to ask her how she did it. Because those boundaries are going to make a difference in your life. I promise you. But girding up the loins of your mind. And if you look at that word mind, it actually talks about the soul. Your emotions being part of that. Amen. All right. So we talked about likeness on last week. That is the resemblance concretely modeling his behavior, representing him or representing him. So we want to resemble another, amen? And then I'll give you guys the rest of them so that we can get into this next part of it. We talked about being fruitful, producing good fruit or helpful results. And um, we looked at it as two separate words, fruit and full and so fruit means productive and full um is defined as having a volume okay so remember we want to produce a volume of fruit but we want to make sure that it's productive or good helpful fruit amen as um, the other plan for man is to replenish the earth that is the hebrew word Mala or male. It's pronounced two different ways. And it means to be full, to fill, or to fill repeatedly. So remember, I talked about how the enemy will come in and snuff out a lot of the nation of Jesus Christ. That's us. He takes us out because we didn't operate in the mind of Christ. We chose to come into agreement with him. We allowed him to keep us held down by his strongholds. So he takes out the body of Christ and then those that the Lord has had hidden away, like the, um, the uh, 7,000 prophets, I think it was 7,000, right? How many prophets? 700, Seven, 700, 700 more, yes. The prophets that God had hidden away in a cave, they came out and then they refilled or replenished, okay? So every time that we have a group of people who are walking away from the Lord, allowing the enemy to infiltrate our camps, infiltrate the, what's supposed to be the embassy. The embassy is where you transact business on behalf of a sovereign or a king. So we're supposed to be transacting business for the Lord, dominating in the earth. That's what we're supposed to do. Again, a mind shift is not about coming to church and giving it to God. He's looking for us to dominate. So when you're telling him, give it to God, He's looking for you to dominate over those cigarettes. He's looking for you to dominate over your emotions and over the things that are coming against you. Whatever it is, he's looking for us to dominate over it. That is our responsibility in the earth. The other is to subdue, which is the word kabas, which is defined as to subject, to subdue, to force, to keep under, to bring into bondage, to conquer and reduce to subjection. He's looking for us to do it. He placed us in the earth for this reason. Now think about it. We read all of the beautiful things that he put in the Garden of Eden. Why would he put Adam in there to do all of that if there was nothing but trees and flowers and birds? And think about it. Something was in that garden or else God would not have told Adam, be prepared to war. That's what all of this stuff is about, preparing us for war, preparing us to dominate, preparing us to take dominion, no longer to be subject, but to subjugate. I must have missed that last week. <laughs> what you just said, oh my God. Think about it. So, and I don't know that I said it last week. Okay. I, I'm, I didn't, it's coming, it's coming straight from hot off the press. Hot off the press. Amen. So when we read that last week, all of the beautiful things that were made, why did he say, I made you in my likeness, my image, and then I put you in here to dominate, to subjugate, to subdue, to force, to keep under, bring into bondage, to conquer, to reduce to subjection. I put you in there because I knew you would be able to conquer because I'm in you. When Adam came into agreement with the enemy, God left. And the enemy was in. When Adam 
chose to eat the fruit. Mm -hmm. We're getting ready to go through it right now. Don't worry, I got you. I got you. Eve, and so when you said Adam did it, I'm like, wait a minute. It's both. Okay. They both did. We're getting ready to go through it. You'll see it. Okay. Yep. And we're getting ready to go through that. I'm getting ready to talk about all of that. We got it. Come on, I'm getting ahead of myself, y'all. All right. So is everybody clear that we're not handing it over to God to take care of? He gave us dominion. Now check this. Verse 29, Genesis 1, 29 and 30. Where y'all Bibles at? I don't see no Bibles but one. on the. All right, I, I see three. All right, y'all better pull them phones out and look on them phones. All right. Come on, read for me. Somebody read verse um, Genesis 1, 29 and 30. King James is fine. And God said, Behold, I have given you every firm bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the in the in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. All right. I want you to go back to verse 29. And I'm going to read it from the New King James, and I want you to hear the word given and count how many times God said it. See, I, God, have given you every herb that yields seed which is on the face of the earth and every tree whose fruit yields seed to you it shall be for food also to every beast of the earth to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life i have given every green herb for food and it was so now in the king james they used given more often but i want you to pay attention that god repeated himself given Pull up that word for me, given, in blueletterbible.org. Because I want you to see the definition of that word given. Uh-huh. Oh, good. It's on the bottom of the definition sheet. I don't have them in front of me. Look, I done gave y'all the answer and didn't even know I gave it to you. <laughs> Praise his name. So the word given is at the bottom of the definition sheet. And so it is the word nothan, which is defined as grant, permit, ascribe, employ, appoint, assign, and entrust it. So what God is saying, he has permitted us, he's given us authorization to utilize the dominance, subduing, all of those war words that he gave us, we're authorized to do it, to take control over the area he has given us. Do you understand? So anything that he's placed us in, we have the right to dominate in. Are y'all with me tonight? You feel like it's a test? Why would it be a test? Why would he test you to see how strong you are? For, Let's uh, think through that. For my purpose. For your purpose. For what's coming next. Okay. So I want you to. Yeah. He's testing you for your back to, to, to see, to get, like he was telling Adam to be ready. And for, so I, like, so these little tests that he gives us, he's preparing us for whatever is coming. Okay. That's how I see. Okay. <laughs> Thanks so for helping me. <laughs> <let's>, <laughs> I needed help. <laughs> that's good. So let's, let's think a little deeper. What would be the purpose of a test? When you're in school, why are you given a test? See how smart you are? No. And it's well, not to see how smart you are. Learn. To see what? Learning what learn. you've learned. To see if you can apply what you've learned. So he's not testing to see how strong you are. He's testing to see if you're gonna apply what you've learned. You've been taught. You're being trained. Every day you sit in here, 
Whether it's a Thursday, a Sunday, a Tuesday, a Monday, it doesn't matter. Every time you are under the tutelage of one of us, you are being trained. Every sermon is a training. Every Bible study is a training. You are being trained and a test comes to prove that you got it. It's not about your strength. It's not about your strength. Not by power, nor by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. He wants to make us strong. You know how we, what was the song? Uh, yes, Jesus loves me. It's wrong. Sing the song. That's all right, you got it. The Bible tells me so. Because mm -hmm. it says, give me the words. Me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. That's true. That is not what the Bible says. What? The Bible says that when we are weak, he comes to make us strong. That is what the Bible says. That is what scripture says. But what did we do with that song? We put it all back on God. But what does Genesis tell us? We're to dominate. We're to subjugate. We're to subdue. Y'all with me? Do y'all see it? <laughs> yes. Yeah. The Bible says, woe unto the inhabitants of the earth, for the devil has come down to you. Think about it. There was something in there to dominate. And God needed them to know, this is what you're here for. So I want us, what we're going to do over the next couple of lessons, not this one, because we're 814 already. We're going to look at two examples of failed attempts of dominion. So whenever you want to understand how to overcome, we have to go to the annals of history, which is what's in our Bible. The word is our historical records, and we can do research or what we learned this weekend as a case study on every situation that's taken place so that history does not repeat itself. So what we have to do is we have to look at them at a case by case basis. And then we look at them in depth. We want to look at the details. We want to do a detailed examination of whatever is going on with it. And it has to be in a real world context. So whatever was happening, we've got to look at it for what was happening then and then look at how it actually applies to us today. But more than that, we want to make sure that we can actually put a solution or strategy in place based on their success or based on the failures that took place. Amen? Because why? We want to dominate, rule, overtake, subjugate, right? So that's what we are doing. So tonight, what I want us to do is, is examine, analyze, and identify, but more importantly, for us to strategize on how we can use the information that we are looking at to better the outcomes for ourselves or for those that may encounter the same things that we encounter in the future. Remember, he told Adam to be fruitful. And being fruitful means that you provide seed that's going to produce more fruit that looks like who? You. It's going to look like God if we're connected to the root. But if we've got those other traits, remember we talked about the spirit of rebellion, the spirit of rejection. If those manifestations, if that fruit is active in your life, you're going to reproduce that. Okay? So we want to make sure that if they encounter the same things that we've encountered in the future, that we have an answer for them to help them to overcome. Jesus said it like this to Peter. He says, Simon Peter, Simon Peter, the devil desires to sift you like wheat, but I am praying for you. Now, when you sift wheat, you're literally taking this big, and Rhonda and I got a chance to see it. This stone was probably, what, six, seven foot tall? And it probably was maybe about mm, good two and a half, three foot wide or so. 
And what they would do is they would use oxen to roll it over the grains. And so when the um, wind would blow and they had a winnowing fork that they would scoop the straw out of it. And then what was left was what was good. You had your wheat and then you had your, the stalk of it that's no good for you. They would keep the wheat and get rid of that stalk. So in the end, why did I bring that up? I brought that up for a reason. Hold on. I just lost my whole train of thought because I'm back in Israel now. Over here running around with that big old. <laughs> yes. So when you sift wheat, imagine, thank you. Imagine what um, Satan wanted to do to Peter. If that big old rock is what was rolling over the grain or what was rolling over the grapes too to get wine and rolling over the um, olives to get olive oil, what do you think Satan wanted to do to Peter? He desired to sift them like wheat. Now, when I was a kid, we would uh, bake cookies with mommy and we had to sift the flour. We would bake cakes. When you sift that flour, you make it to where it's nothing but powder where you can blow it and it's gone. Think about that. He wanted to make Peter take him down to nothing, to where all he had to do was blow and Peter was gone. That's how the enemy is still working and operating today. But we are greater and stronger because who is in us, because of who is in us. So he says, Simon Peter, Simon Peter, the devil desires to sift you like wheat, but I am praying for you. God is seated where? On the right hand of God doing what? praying for us day and night. Amen. So he's still praying for us. No different. You know, that was Peter. No, he's doing for us right now. He desires to sift you like wheat, but I am praying for you. That after you've been strengthened, that you will go back and strengthen your brethren. Amen. So that is what the Lord wants us to do. Once we are stronger, once we have been made whole, once we are healed, he wants us to go out and heal others. Remember, he wants to do something for you. Then he wants to do it in you, but ultimately through you. Amen. All right. So what we're doing, we're literally leaving a breadcrumb trail for the generations that are to come. That posterity that we're talking about. Is everybody with me tonight? All right, let's go to Genesis 2, and we're going to read starting from verse 1, and we are going to read through verse 7. All right. Thus the heavens and earth and all the hosts of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. This is the history. Now notice that word history. History is defined as the study of past events, particularly in human affairs. So can we do a case study? Because it's historical facts, right? So this is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, amen? Sanctified means set apart, made holy, okay? So before any plant of the field was in the earth and before any herb of the field had grown, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth and there was no man to till the ground. But a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. So anything that God creates, he already has ability to sustain. Y'all see that? So nobody was there to till it and make it reproduce. Y'all see that? But it would have sustained itself from what he had created and designed it to be. Amen? All right. And so, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living. If you look at it in the King James, it actually says soul. What's our study on? Soul under control man became a living soul amen so verse a says and the lord god formed man from the i'm sorry that's verse seven the lord god formed man 
of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. What is a soul? What does it, what does a soul consist of? Who remembers? Uh-huh. Emotions. Uh-huh. One more. The strongest part of a man. W, w. Starts with a W. Will. Yes. Look at you two. Go, rock stars. So your soul is made up of your mind, will, and emotions. So go back to the scripture. So the first thing that happened is God created, took the dirt, and he formed a body out of the dust of the ground. And then it says he breathed. That word actually is blue, like that, like a sneeze almost. Blue, the breath of life. And man became a living soul. I want us to look at that definition of the breath of life. It is not in your definition. So OC is going to pull it up. And it's actually Strong's H5397. And it's Nishama. Nishama. Okay. So if you scroll down or click on the H5397. This is going to blow your mind. So let's look at the definition of this. Scroll a little bit more. All right. So it's a breath, but he breathed his spirit. Scroll down a little more. Here we go, right here. So this is the Strong's definition. So it, it's a very strong breath that breathed. Look at what went inside Adam when he breathed that breath. Divine inspiration. His intellect. That would be his mind, right? So his soul and spirit all were released within him when God blew his breath. Soul and spirit went into that dust body and he became a living soul. So now he has spirit, a body, and mind, will, and emotions. We were learning this this weekend. So I had to go search it out and see if what we were taught was true. Boom, there it is. So God breathed those things into him. And again, we're made in the likeness and in the image of God, right? Does God have a soul? He must. Where did God come from? He always existed. I know, but I don't know. I mean, they know who created Jesus and all that and everything after that, but who, who where did, how did God? He always God? existed, period. That's it. He is the beginning and the end. Period. So just basically we can't answer that until we die? That's what you're saying? I don't know that there is any other answer. I don't believe there is any other answer. If he's the alpha, he's the beginning, he is it. He always existed. And he created everything else. So, including the waster to destroy, which is Lucifer and all of his imps, nymphs, and wimps. <laughs> right? He created them, everything. He created it all. He always existed, period. There's no thinking around that. Because if someone else created God, that means he is not the ultimate creator. Mm -hmm. Either he's the creator or he's not. So there is no other answer for that. He always existed. And he decided to create. Once he decided to create, we existed. I think for those who like, have not, who are just learning and haven't been raised that way, it's kind of hard to like, Come to grips with that. Like the kids, like I, I don't know, I don't have an answer for them. I just, I, I just, I don't know. God is the one who created everything. I don't, 
I can't give you an answer. <laughs> but as long as that's your answer, they'll always be down in their minds too. Think about it. As long as you're going, I'm not quite sure if he didn't create himself. They're going to be like, I'm not quite sure if God is the real God. Because remember where every thought, once you attach an emotion to it, you act on the emotion, you dictate your destiny. So whatever it is, that is the answer. It's going to start the creation of it. So the way that you answer that for him, them, if you're not confident and you're not sure, they're not sure if everything else you're telling them about God is right. I'm sure God was the creator, but the questions that they're asking me, I don't know. The Tell answer. them you don't know and I'll ask. And that's, if there's questions that you guys ask that I don't know, let me go ask Apostle. I don't know everything. I'm, there are things I am still, we sat and we learned. They asked me a question on Saturday. After I heard these scholarly answers come by, the question came to me. I said, they covered it all. She said, no, they didn't. I said, okay, that's why I'm in this class. <laughs> I did. I literally did. They sat right there and listened to me say it. I said, and this is why I'm in this class. She said, I love it. That was her answer. I did not know. The answer was research. I would have never thought that we had to do a case study and research on what's in the word so that we can, that was what she was looking for. The way that she posed the question, I didn't get that was the answer she was looking for. And all of the string of answers they gave, I was like, dang, you know? <laughs> Yeah, great answers. Good job. Sherman, Sherman, Sherman. That's how I felt. But I'm just telling the truth. That's how I felt in that, in that class on Saturday morning. But at the end of it all, I, 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 by that time, I was like number what, seven? Number seven in the line? They had waxed every answer that I even came close to thinking. So I'm like, what else could be left? So if I don't know the answer, I don't know the answer. Let me ask and then I'll get back to you. But don't give an unsure answer because the unsure answer is going to start the creation of doubt in them. Be confidently, I don't know. Let me ask. I'll get back to you. Because your grandkids, they got some questions. And I don't think that they expected me to be able to answer what I did. You, it, it, I promise you, I see in pictures. It's how I see. I see in pictures. And I could see their brains like little clocks like this, just turning. And they were all around me. And one would shoot a question and I'd be like, boom. And the other one would come right behind them, boom. And I was just, I had every gun going. And finally, you came over and said, okay, give her a break. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They've got good questions. So be okay saying, I don't know that answer. Let me find out. And then I'll answer you later. I think it's just that we all have a creator. Like I know God is our number one creator, but we come from parents. Their parents come from parents and so on. And I think that's how their Jesus came from God. And well, who did God come from? Well, I, nobody, God, that's it. It stops there, you know, and I just don't, I don't know if they're just too young to understand. They're or, on the beat. But they just, and then they, they, like they do you, they do me. They just keep coming and coming. And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> don't let them frustrate you. Because I saw them do it, not just with Bible study, but I saw them do it at the picnic. They wanted you to fix something and do something right now for something about a swimsuit. And it's everything. That is not them wanting to know. That is them controlling and dominating you. Yes. You. Oh, I yeah. like went off my shoulder. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Yeah. Because you want to be grandma. But in this case, if you're going to raise them, you got to be mama. It wouldn't have ran that way for her. The way that I grandparent my grandchildren is totally different. Shut up, OC. <laughs> they told us at Christmas, and we're still not all right with them. How did you say? We're still not all right with them getting away with everything. 
got away with nothing. When a mom like you are a grandma, and I'm like, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, literally. But it's hard because you can't be a grandma. You have to. You're raising them. Yeah. So if you're gonna raise them, you gotta raise them. In the same way you would have raised her with the wisdom you have today. Hear me. The same way you would have raised her with the wisdom you have today. Raise them. If you're gonna raise them. Raise them. You can't be grandma and mom you gotta choose it's gonna be hard but you're gonna have to choose because grandma wants to rub hug love the boo boo oh, i'm sorry it's all right come on yep let's have some cookies and let me tell you what happens when you sneak and give them cookies after their parents said not to <laughs> let me tell you i'm repenting because i'm starting to feel anger rise up right now but jasmine had gotten in trouble with her mom and her dad we were in Florida and she was told, well, since you're doing that, you're not getting any ice cream. I said, wait till they leave. I'm grandma, I'm Nana, that's what Nana's do. So they left, I said, come on, baby. They took the big kids and they went to go and ride the boats at night and see the lights in Jacksonville. And I had her because I was not feeling so great. So we went back to the room and I said, I'll go get the ice cream. You choose a movie. And she said, well, I want to watch the movie out there in the living room. And I said, Nana doesn't feel very well. And it's only one couch out there. So we're going to watch the movie in here in the room. It's this big old king size bed. We're fine. I want to watch the movie out there. Jasmine, we're watching the movie in here. I'm going to go get the ice cream. She's got her little teddy bear. Well, I don't want to watch the movie, Van. I said, what? <laughs> Wait a minute. Three? Three. She was three. Well, I don't want to watch the movie then. I said, okay, Vince is doing exactly that. He's cracking up. I'm getting angry. And I said, well, since you don't want to watch the movie then, you can put your pajamas on and your pull-up on and you can go to bed. She said, okay. She went, got her pajamas, got her pull-up on, came out with her little bear and said, I'm ready to go to bed. And I sat there. I'm like, and I was sneaking you ice cream? I said, okay, we'll go to bed then. So I put her in the bed. I leave the light on because I'm feeling bad because I'm making her go to bed. No ice cream. So I leave the light on and I walk out and I go in my room. Now, her room's here. My room's here. Literally. All I got to do is peek out the door and I can see her. D'Angelo's room is right here. And you hear, ah! she's screaming at the top of her lungs and we're in a condo. There are people above us. I'm like, oh my gosh, she starts screaming. Mommy, say And that's it. I said, did she say, mommy, save me? He said, she's punking you right now. <laughs> I text Kamika and I, OC and I said, me and Jasmine just had a little tiff and I gave them the big long list of what happened. And I told them everything that went down. And I said, and she's screaming, mommy, save me. I said, she didn't get a spanking or nothing. I said, so I don't know why she's screaming, mommy, save me. Kamika text back. Nana, meet Jasmine. Jasmine, meet Nana. Have a good night. <laughs> Who comes out of their room? Why y'all doing mohawk like that? <laughs> Who goes and lays with her and rubs her head until she falls asleep and she's getting treats and everything? I was ticked. But I was being Nana because mommy and daddy were coming home. And mommy and daddy on the ride home, I'm in the back sick. I mean, sick as a dog, stuff's coming out of everything, right? Every orifice I had, something was coming out of it. And she said something slick to Kamika and I literally woke up just enough to hear her say something slick to Kamika and Kamika said, then I guess you don't wanna watch that DVD player then. And she said, well, I guess I'll watch it. I said, oh, that's how you do that? She said, yep. I got punked because I was being Nana. But she was going home to mommy and daddy. 
So you got to make a choice because my kids wouldn't have got away with that. They would have said one little slick remark and they'd have been snatched right on into that room and the door would have closed and I wouldn't have said nothing else. That would have been the end of it. I wouldn't have cared. But because I'm Nana and I've got this soft heart, it's easy to just back off. And yeah, because you're grandma, you're not mama. And so because things are out of order right now, you got to set the order. Boundaries. Amen? Dominate or be dominated. Subjugate or be subjected. Become a strong man or live in a stronghold. What's it going to be? Yeah. Boom. <laughs> there you go. There you go. All right. So we understand that God does have a soul. I'm going to give you all a couple of scriptures. I'm not even going to look them up. Write them down. Look them up yourself. Leviticus 26, 11. It says, and I will set my tabernacle among you and my soul shall not abhor you. God has a soul. He has a mind. He has a will. He has emotions. Isaiah 42 and 1 says, behold, my servant. Isaiah is getting the word from the Lord and prophesying it about Jesus. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my elect or chosen, one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. Amen. So God has a soul. We're going to stop there because it is 839. This has been a good, good Bible study. Good talk. Amen. When we come back, we're going right into verse eight. Amen. So we'll go into verse eight and nine and, and kind of wrap that whole thing up about um, eight, eight and nine. And then we'll look at 15 through 17 of Genesis chapter two. So read that before we get back because we're going to go right in. Read Genesis chapter um, two. Read all of it. That is your homework for the week. The whole chapter, the whole chapter Genesis verse okay. two. Okay? Because when we come in, so read Genesis ver chapter two and chapter three. Read them both. Y'all can do that, right? Y'all got that? Chapter two, 2 and chapter 3. So understand, as a scion, and this is what I need us to take away, when we're talking about um, the plan for man in the earth to be fruitful, to produce good and helpful results, to be full of fruit, to have a volume of it, not only are you producing fruit, but you're producing fruit that remains and advances the kingdom, that feeds the posterity that is to come, right? Multiplying, reproducing or increasing to cause to increase greatly in number or quantity. So it shouldn't be us four and no more. We should see this place start to fill up. Why? Because of what God is doing in us, because of the light, the power that they see in us. I gave a person the ride and that person yawned the entire ride. I wasn't even doing anything but just sitting in the car. But the very power that is exuding from me was driving them devils out left and right. The whole time they yawned the entire ride. So that should be happening within each and every one of us. That Jesus Christ in you should be driving the devils out of other people around you. Some of them are just going to be irritated. You don't even do anything. They just get irritated. All you do is walk in the room and they're like, I can't stand it. That's what that literally is. Yeah, but you know what? And that's what I told you. We're going to teach you how to bind. You've got to learn how to bind. You don't cast everything out. Now, them devils was like, I'm not even going to fool with her. I already know who she is. And they left. They all threw Indianola. But at the end of the day, they couldn't stay in my car. I didn't even have worship music playing. I wasn't doing anything. We were just talking. Now, what I will say that it did do is that while we were in Indianola and I was by myself, I did worship. I did. So that ride back was rough. <laughs> it was rough. I was cool. Smiling the whole way. Because <laughs> I knew exactly what was happening. We're to dominate. We're to have dominion, to have rule, to dominate, to tread down, to 
crumble, right? They have lordship, sovereign, or supreme authority. Replenish means to fill repeatedly. That way we are, God is saving for himself a posterity. And then to subdue, to subject, to subdue, to force, to keep under, bring into bondage, to conquer, and reduce to subjection. That's what we're here for. So I need you to check your fruit. Is that what's happening in your world? Or are you being dominated? Amen? Good stuff.